name is Wiata Thomas. <laughs> Should I start with that? <laughs> um, and I have uh, been, I'm Liberian originally. My family's um, from Liberia, Monrovia. Um, I'm also somewhat Sierra Leonean as well because my people group is right on the border. Um, and, but I was born and raised in the States. And so I've been back in um, Guinea. I've been in Guinea since 2011, the end of 2011. And um, basically I wanted to come back um, because I really believe deeply in us investing in our continent. And so I first came actually, of course I'm from Liberia, I wanted to go home, but I came with Peace Corps. And so it was an easy way for me to get back to the continent and kind of test my ideas around economic development, you know, investment, um, just trying to see how my theories tested out on the ground. Um, but having an organization behind me without, you know, saying, okay, I'm going to take all of my savings and just move, you know, move to Africa, move to, move to Liberia. Um, and so I came with Peace Corps, I was a community economic development volunteer. And um, basically we started out, me and my colleagues started out with a basic entrepreneurship training program um, for young people. Um, our charge was to reduce unemployment in West Africa. And so, um, so with that charge, um, Guinea had something around a 71% unemployment rate, and it's still quite high for young people. And so we, we you know, reflected and decided that if we're going to get out of this situation, um, young people have to start businesses to create employment. But we realized very quickly that the ecosystem is so poor, is so highly underdeveloped, that it's very difficult for a young person to go from training all the way to launching a business um, with uh, with only with only um, with only training with only um, their initial training. So we started Dare to Innovate in order to provide not only training but also investment and um, coaching and support relation with markets that sort of thing to support um, young entrepreneurs. Um, and so we started in 2013. We now have invested in 60 businesses around the country. Um, we're the only incubator that you'll find in every part of um, Guinea. So we have businesses literally around the country, all the way down to the forest region, to two-day drive away. We're, we're, we're everywhere. Um, we, we also, something that's unique about Dare to Innovate is that we are a nonprofit. Dare to Innovate is a nonprofit um, incubator, but we invest in the entrepreneurial ecosystem to ignite social change. That's our mission. And so we also operate as a social business and we also operate kind of in a studio model. So we will develop businesses internally that become um, uh, private sector companies that support the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So to give you an example, we launched an app called Oze, which is now um, in the top five of apps being used in Ghana by small businesses. And it's a business coach in your pocket. So what it is is the interface um, you're able to enter in all of your, your, your buying, your selling, and on the other side, we're able to recoup that information and push you advice to grow your business and prepare you for investment. We're also able to print out things like financial statements. Um, so things that small businesses across West Africa are having issues with, um, we're able to, to um, provide them the solution. And so Oze is a private sector company. Dare to Innovate, the NGO owns shares in that company because it was born out of Dare to Innovate. So it's, um, again, it's a studio, studio venture model um, where we create businesses that support the ecosystem. Um, Oze is doing really well. We just closed our first round of investment. Um, we just won MEST um, in Kenya. So um, we're doing really well. It's growing really fast. Um, and we have a few other companies that we've launched as well here in Guinea that, um, that also subscribe to the same model. So here we've launched two main companies, Natri and SparkRise Ventures. Um, what we do with Natri um, is that one of, our, one of our programs is our AgriHub. Through our AgriHub, we develop agricultural value chains. And what we will do is we'll train young people to launch a micro industry or a micro exploitation um, on a piece of land. Um, and then we will manage the entire rest of the value chain. So the logistics to the end buyer, aggregating inputs. Um, we'll even help them find land so that they'll all install um, in, install their, their businesses and um, they'll share certain resources, sharing water, electricity. They'll share investments, certain investments, um, to all to reduce their costs. Um, and then we manage, the naturally manages the, the two market side of the, of the business. So um, to give you an example, 
Um, Aqua Farms Africa is one of the companies that we've started. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take you out and show you the the system that we have and how that works. Um, but it uses this this concept of social franchising um, to give young people more of a chance to to be able to manage the entire value chain. It's very very difficult in Guinea and across West Africa to start a business and then have to manage all parts of the value chain. So from inputs all the way to production, to processing, to, to logistics, to the end market. Um, for a young, a young Guinean, a young West African, it's very difficult to do if you don't have all of the competency and the resources to do that. So our concept of social franchising um, with the AgriHub model allows them to focus only on production and us to focus on developing the rest of the, the value chain with services um, to to those end markets. Um, so that's that's generally what we do. We do it in agro business. We also do it in. Um, we have another another program called our Accelerator for Urban Urban um, Urban Industries. And so we also do the same thing with other with other sectors like boulangerie, like baking, patisserie. We have a brand there. We have. Um, making uh, bricks and paved stones from recycled plastic. So that's a company called Resiplast. And so, excuse me, and so that's another, um, another franchise that we have where we train young people again in one specific um, area. They learn how to, to make the, the product and then we manage the rest of the value chain with branding and marketing of the product. So, voila. <laughs> okay, so um, let's go out here. So, um, so Sabutech is, um, is, like I said, one of our um, competitors, but also we partner with them. They are um, owned and, I will say owned, they're, they're invested in by Bolloré, which is um, a French company that, that manages ports. Um, and so Bolloré started the Blue Zones, first of all, um, which was between Bolloré and Blue Line Solutions. Blue Line Solutions is a company within the Bolloré group that creates um, innovations. Um, and so what they did actually, this was in 2014, 2013, 2014, they developed a battery that's able to hold um, uh, solar energy for a very long periods of time. And so in all of the countries that they operate, they installed, blue, they installed not necessarily blue zones, but blue zones, but they installed um, some sort of uh, um, something that would that would um, show that they're doing, you know, show the show the technology, show off the technology. So in some countries it was blue buses, some countries it was blue cars, here it was blue zones. And so they decided to also put an incubator within the blue zone, which is Sabutec. Um, and so we are actually partnered with Bolloré um, and Blue Line Solutions, now also Vivandi. Vivandi is um, uh, also within the Bolloré group. It's a, it's a media company, but they now have taken over the blue zones. And so they have also they've given us um, this land as well as access to um, water um, and electricity. So the space, blue zone spaces, have um, water and electricity 24/7, um, and it's a way to showcase the technology coming from Blue Line Solutions. So just to give you a little bit of the background and why we're on this space, this is our aquaponic system. Um, so one of the companies in the same model that um, I explained earlier, Aqua Farms Africa, um, what we do is aquaponics. And so aquaponics is, um, if you don't know, the mix between um, fish farming and vegetable growing. And so the waste from the fish feeds the plants and the plants filter water for the fish. And so um, it's, a, it's a closed system. It recycles water. Traditional agriculture has about 40% water loss, whereas aquaponics has zero to 7% water loss. Um, so it can, it really is, it conserves water. Um, so it's really great for the environment. It's also um, a very, we were able to control the environment inside of the, the greenhouse. And so because of that, we're able to produce niche products that are normally imported. So right now in Guinea, all of the biggest um, food food buyers, besides the local the local population, so I'll say hotels, restaurants, mining companies, um, they all import their food. And the reason why is because local farmers don't have the the investment nor the nor I'd say the the technical expertise to be able to provide quality, consistent quality produce all year round, every week, 
um, to these to these suppliers or to these buyers. And so, um, so what we can do with an aquaponic system is that we're able to um, control the environment, control water use to produce really niche products. For instance, arugula, romaine lettuce, um, microgreens, endive. Um, we, we do cherry tomatoes. We're doing strawberries. Um, in a system that that allows for um, for for I mean it's, it's a system that that it controls the entire environment. Um, it's highly productive. So you have um, somewhere around uh, five to ten tons, even up to ten tons of produce that can come out of this system per month. Um, and um, so that's kind of generally what we're doing. I'm going to take you into the system so you can see a little bit of what we're doing. Our aquaponic system. Um, so the idea is that this is a 12 by 12 meter system. Um, we, we decided to do the, the smallest unit that could be highly productive but was um, reduced the cost enough for a young person to be able to invest. And we do the same thing with all of the different value chains that we develop. So um, this system cost somewhere around for a young person to invest or a group of young people somewhere around seven to eight thousand um, dollars which is very very cheap if you think of, of what it costs to actually invest in for instance one hectare of land so one hectare of land here to invest without buying the land not not taking into account buying the land and, and that sort of thing it's around ten thousand um, dollars and then that's the the you don't have all of the benefits that come with um, being in an aquaponic system which controls the environment. So the $10,000 doesn't include things like drip irrigation if you wanted to control your water better, um, or greenhouses, for instance. So if you're going to go to like greenhouses and um, drip irrigation, your investment becomes significantly more. And so the great thing about aquaponics is that you can invest in one system, and then really what you're doing afterwards to adapt to your clientele is just changing the seeds. And so it's really highly adaptable to, to niche markets. Um, we're able to give young people um, real revenue. Um, something that's, that really bothers me with a lot of projects that come around entrepreneurship um, in West Africa is that it's, it's about giving people the minimum. Um, when there's real markets that can be developed um, if we create the system, the environment, the ecosystem that allows for them to access those markets and build products or produce products that are high quality and respond to those markets. So, so the concept of social franchising and what we're doing with Aqua Farms Africa is that. So, um, the numbers are are incredible. I can't even really tell you all of them because we're still testing out. This is a prototype. So, this is our first system. Um, we've already trained 25 young women actually as a part of a project called Fam Sam Barrier Women Without Borders to run their own aquaponic systems. So, we did a training over, let's say, two months. Um, and now they're in their internship stage. Um, so they're not here today, actually, um, which I would have loved to, to, for you to meet the, the women who are learning. But um, the idea is that we're training them. Each group of five is going to form their own um, JEO, which is like a, co a, a cooperative, an economic cooperative. Um, and then they'll, they'll be invested in their own um, aquaponic systems. We will be, um, uh, we have financial partners, so several banks in Guinea that will be working with us. So that they can invest in their in their um, aquaponic systems. So, how do the girls find out about uh, the project? Do you go looking for them, or do they come looking for you? So, Aqua Farms Africa. I'm going to talk from the standpoint of Aqua Farms Africa yeah. partners with um, Dare to Innovate. So, um, Dare to Innovate is, like I said, one of the one of the biggest incubators in Guinea, um, um, which we started in in 2012. And so, we have a lot of people coming to us all the time. And we run about five programs every year. And so with those programs, we usually will insert the, these value chains into those programs. So for instance, we launch a program. Um, we'll say that we're going to be training people in these eight value chains. And the, the young people coming into, those, into the program will choose which value chains they want to, they want to invest in and grow in. And so from the beginning, they know exactly how much they can make. They, they have a business plan for that, for that value chain. Um, they know exactly how long it's going to take for them to get to revenue. Um, they know that they have end buying contracts because we already have set up end buying contracts um, through the, the, the company, Aqua Farms Africa. 
Um, and so really it's, a, it's like a business in a box. They're able to come in, um, get training, get the technical training, get the management training, and, and, and be able to, to launch their business. And you mentioned that um, you're working with different investors, banks, and so on. So how do the girls eventually, do the units become theirs eventually? Yes. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So after they finish their training and we've given them a, a check that, you know, they are they are ready to, to be able to go on to, to launching their, their franchise, um, we will either partner with the bank so that they get a loan, um, because we have end buying contracts, um, we're able to to better secure loans for them. Um, also, because the the way that the process works is that they start with their technical training and their management training, then they go to a stage that's internship. So they'll run a full cycle of production without owning the system that they're in. So this the they'll have a rolling fund, so they'll be able to manage money. Um, and they'll, they'll do that for one cycle. So after the cycle, they'll have a financial statement, they'll have experience, and they have some revenue to then be able to invest in their, their franchise. Um, and so we have two ways of finding investment for the franchise. Um, one is, like I said, through banks, so through um, local banks that we're building partnerships with. The other side is private, private investment. So through Aqua Farms Africa, um, we have private investors that are Basically, we, we buy everything needed for the system, and then the loan is to us. It's a loan, um, I'm not sure, like a, a goods loan, right? So it's, it's the equipment that they that they get. How did you come up with this idea? <laughs> Where did it all start? Oh my gosh, it so actually, genius. <laughs> so actually, um, Aqua Farms Africa, okay, so, so to start with Dare to Innovate, um, and the, the concept of social franchising, yeah. basically through through the time that I've, we've been spending with um, with entrepreneurs, um, I've seen how difficult it is for businesses to be able to, for, for a young person to be able to manage the, the whole value chain. It's nearly impossible. And so we had a lot of entrepreneurs who came through the program, um, through our incubator program, and they, they couldn't, they, they didn't survive. They maybe survived one cycle, one production cycle, but afterwards um, they quickly failed or they, they didn't fail, but they're still trying. They're struggling. They're they're just they're still there, but they they just aren't making real revenue. And so um, the concept just came to me that if I was going to because I have I have access to a lot of investment. Um, something that I believe that we as as people who have are African but have lived overseas, um, we have more access to doors open doors than than young people. So I have access to investors. I could easily just start a big industry. I really could build my business plan and, and get my investment and, and I could do that. Um, but the social franchise model allows um, us to be able to really build local economy and give young people hope and also just like owning their own, owning something like and really being able to see that this works. Because what we've also seen is that Young people are starting, in Guinea at least, are starting to get tired of, of entrepreneurship and incubation as like a solution because there hasn't been the investment behind it to really develop these value chains or really help them to get to the next level. So a lot of times we'll find young people in our, in our incubator, we give them seed funding, they'll prove that their business works, but then to get that second injection of capital that they need to grow, really, really difficult. Um, and then if they do get that a small injection of capital to grow, then where's the next investment? It's always about how do I find how do I find investment? How do I grow my company? And so they get stagnant. You know, we have businesses that need investment and they could grow. They have really great concepts. They've proved the concept, but it's been very slow to grow because they don't have they don't have these other resources. So the idea was how can we, how might we? So I, I use that specific phrase because we use a lot of design thinking in what we do at Dare to Innovate. So how might we um, develop the ecosystem in a way that really, that truly supports young entrepreneurs? The other thing is that we saw that when we train, a lot of times projects like UNDP, USAID, all these projects, they come in and they need to train large numbers of people. So a thousand people, two thousand people. So if we get a contract to train 500 young people, um, you can't incubate 500 young people like that's not that's not classic incubation, um, and so we may have we may have 10 out of 500 that are real entrepreneurs, 
meaning they have the vision, the competency, the, the ability to grow a business that'll attract investment, that'll create employment. So what do we do with everyone else? You know, that's motivated, they normally would probably be employees. They're normally probably not even entrepreneurs. But because employment doesn't exist, how do we create a system that will, where they can own their own employment? And so that's really all of that together was where the social franchising concept came out of. So for Aqua Farms Africa, and what I've done with all of the different value chains is that I found partners um, who are building the business of a certain business in a specific value chain who have wanted to wanted to come into our system. So my partner for um, Aqua Farms Africa, her name is Bakita Mahama. She's the technical person behind all of this. She had the idea of, of aquaponics, um, building aquaponics in, in West Africa. And so I was like, well, I've got this great idea of social franchising, can we combine them together? And so that was the birth of Aqua Farms Africa. And so she came, she moved here. She's um, American, uh, but married to a Ghanaian and um, has doesn't speak a word of French, <laughs> but moved to Guinea. And um, and we just we just made it work. We put together the system, and and now we're you know we're building it. So we're at revenue now. We um, we just had our first uh, deliveries actually this past month um, to Millennium Hotel, which is one of the one of the hotels here. And we have two other clients, um, Avenue and Sheraton Hotels, um, that that'll be our, our first clients um, with the system. I'm curious. Uh, before Aqua Farms Africa and before Dare to Innovate, mm -hmm. uh, where were you? Like, <laughs> oh. like what uh, what right. brought you to this journey to the point where you were like, okay, I need to go back home. I need to uh, make a change to make things work for young people. Here. So um, <laughs> my story is crazy, <laughs> but um, I I finished I finished undergrad and my last year of undergrad I took three courses that was um, ecology I took sociology of economics and African economics all at the same time and before that I was looking to work in public health or you know I wanted to do something in the nonprofit world um, but those three courses together made me realize that absolutely for me the basis of development in Africa is economic development. We have to be autonomous in order to, to grow and to develop our continent. And it's also about freedom. And I think that economic freedom is probably the basis of all other freedoms in my in my opinion. And so this this became a passion of mine at that point. I was like, I need to move back. I need to I need to um, I need to know what these theories look like on the ground. You know, what is it to actually build businesses? What is it actually to to develop economies in, in Africa, you know, in on the continent? And so I when I first got out of college, I worked in nonprofits. I kind of was all over the place. I worked in nonprofits for a while. I was a flight attendant for a while. I mean, I was just I was just kind of doing a lot of different things. I actually I became a flight attendant during the housing market crash in in um, in the States. So I was laid off three times in one year. Um, <laughs> And so I was like, okay, I'm going to become a flight attendant because I want to travel. Um, I started a real estate investment company. I mean, I've done, I've done a million different things. And when I was, when I was laid off, um, when I was a flight attendant, it was in that time that I was like, you know what, what am I doing? Like, I want, let me go and try, I want to test these ideas now. Like, what am I waiting for? Um, and so I was like, you know, I, I can't just, like I said earlier, can't just save, you know, take all of my savings and just move to a country and just hope it works. So Peace Corps was the easiest way for me to get back to the continent. Um, and I was an economic development volunteer. I knew that I wanted to be in West Africa. I knew that I wanted to be in a French speaking country. I knew I wanted to be an economic development volunteer. And if those three things hadn't have happened, I wouldn't have done Peace Corps. So it was the way for me to get back and test out my ideas. So when I was a Peace Corps volunteer, I started a real. I started. Sorry, I started a fashion company. I worked with artisans, uh, and so we did. We did a couple of export orders to the state. I did um, a moringa company, so we were doing dried moringa, um, and also dried, dried other dried products. Um, I started several companies while I was a volunteer, just to test out and see what what does it look like to start a business on the ground. And so, for me, um, being here is 
this is my life's work. I, I want to spend the rest of my life in on the continent in convincing us to move back. I believe that it doesn't necessarily need to be moved back. I know that it's difficult for, for people to say, I'm going to quit everything and move. I'm crazy, you know. <laughs> but to at least um, be investing in our continent. And the thing is, it's difficult to do that. Um, if I know so many people in the diaspora who really want to invest, but where, how, who, who do I contact? What are the what are the systems in place? What exists? And so, I wanted to really create opportunities for investment for the diaspora. For me, Black people everywhere are African. So us everywhere, we are African, and we are the owners and the originators, and come from the richest continent on earth and so why are we so marginalized and poor everywhere you find us in the world that is a major issue for me and it's part of my why and it's what wakes me up in the morning is that i want to see us free and i want to see us free on our continent and so and so yeah it's that that that's that's why i'm here <laughs> that's why i'm here and so I think with the with the social franchising model, it really creates easy ways also for the diaspora to invest. So, um, like one one greenhouse, eight thousand dollars. That's an easy investment. You know that it's connected to a company. We dare to innovate. The NGO is also managing and, and making sure that everything works. I mean, uh, one of our other franchises is in dried um, fruits, pineapple and mango. Um, one system costs fifteen thousand um, dollars. It it employs um, eight young people. Um, it's like very easy ways to invest and see a return on your money. We are um, all of them are re reimbursable or, or um, reimburse the, the initial investment within one year. And um, we also find other ways to involve the, the diaspora. So, for instance, land obtaining land is really difficult in Guinea for young people, especially, and in general, the the system for for land purchases is really is really a mess right now. And so. What we do is we also connect people who own land, even in Conakry, um, but also the diaspora, with our young people so we can create um, partnerships in that way. So there's all these different ways that we're trying to create the opportunities for investment for the diaspora, bringing us back. We need to be investing in our continent. The world is investing in Africa right now, literally the world. We are, I mean, Africa is the final frontier of investment. And if we don't start investing in our continent now, it will not belong to us in 15 years, in 10 years, literally. And that is what, and, and so that, that, that's what really motivates me. We have to own our continent. We have to become, we have to gain our freedom off of our, our resources. Should I take you through the, the tour? The tour? Okay, so fish is here. Mm -hmm. So the the crate, the smaller fish can hide from the bigger fish. <laughs> yeah, they'll get eaten by the bigger one. So they hide, but it's a it's a whole ecosystem. And so this is powered um, by solar power, um, and there's an air pump and a water pump, and so that keeps air in the system that keeps water flowing. And so then the water leaves here. You see the enters into the side where we're actually growing vegetables. So um, we have uh, this is called the swamp cooler, and it keeps the it keeps the, the um, inside cool. One of the biggest issues we had and are are still dealing with, but um, we've gotten we've done a lot to reduce the temperature. It was very 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 hot. So we have the experience of doing aquaponics in in America or in more moderate um, climates, but how do you adapt that to the Ghanaian context? And so the heat and the humidity were two things that were huge issues. So we added um, shade cloth across the top, we added fans, we have exhaust fans, we have the, um, the swamp cooler, so it all keeps the interior cool. We're gonna probably add one more swamp cooler to keep the whole thing cool. So we go through here. These are um, grow beds. Um, and so this is where we grow things like tomatoes, more like the fruits, tomatoes, um, uh, let's see, tomatoes, green pepper, uh, yellow and red peppers, um, uh, those sort of fruits um, go in the, the grow beds. And again, this is all soilless. Um, 
This is called an NFT tower. This is actually an innovation of my my partner, Bakita. <laughs> so it's a way to grow up um, and using more, using more of the space that we have, which is why I said that we can probably double um, the production of the system just with these towers. So the whole idea is that the water is coming through, it's, it's filled with nutrients. The biggest input in the system is the food, the fish food, because when they're fed and they're happy, they're creating a lot of waste and that goes into the system and that's what feeds everything else. So the more, the more fish we have in the system, the more nutrients we put in the system, the, um, the better our plants are. And so the water comes through and um, these, are, these are the same as the NFT towers, just flat. And so um, we're growing some strawberries here. We've been doing microgreens. So our first product hit the market were microgreens. So the water comes in here. We're actually going to be um, putting shrimp underneath here. So we have tilapia in the big one, and then we'll have shrimp underneath here. So we're actually going to be importing our baby shrimp from Ghana because we haven't been able to find um, shrimp in, in Guinea that we'd be able to, to harvest and bring here. Um, so the two aquatic items we'll be selling will be shrimp and, um, and tilapia. So voila. <laughs> I'm really excited. Um, we just had really great conversations with, uh, with the Sheraton like this past week. And, and it's just, it's super exciting. It's super exciting because they no, no hotel and restaurant in Conakry is able to supply locally. And so this is really going to give, um, give, not only it's going to reduce imports, but it's going to give Guineans, young people, the opportunity to supply markets locally. And that's exciting. And these are the most valuable markets, at least for fresh produce in the, in the country. So it's exciting. One of my papers for my senior thesis was on um, development in uh in the Africa, basically the involvement of development agencies in Africa over every decade. And um, what, I had, what I had learned or seen in my studies is that every decade there's, a, there's like an economic policy that's kind of decided for, for Africa in general from the powers that be, um, but how, how we're going to do development in Africa. And every decade it more or less fails and there's a few things that maybe work, and then they just go to the next decade where they, they experiment again. And, um, but nothing's, nothing's ever worked, and it's always coming from the outside in. And so um, one of the things that I feel, I mean, it was, it, was, it was kind of proof that this is not working, was coming here and seeing what development is doing on the ground. So um, I said this is controversial, but you know, like, Going uh, on, on your way up to Labe, I was placed in Labe as a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, you'll see signs for old projects. Like, there's a bunch of signs. There's like 40 different signs going up. It's like, you know, and they have these acronyms like project for blah, 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 blah. And they're old and rusted. And when you walk into the building to try and ask anybody about it, they're like, oh, yeah, there was that one project. And something that I just saw repeatedly, um, not only with those projects, but then talking to people and seeing what had happened since these projects, um, what was, what was um, the impact? You know, how were you? Are you better off for any any of this? Um, was just that there's this this vicious cycle of so much money being brought into into these countries. Um, and it going to projects that seem good for the moment, and then they're not, but they're not sustainable. And for me, um, what I found, so that that kind of proved what I had, what I had, um, what I had studied. But what I, what I added to that, or what what came to me, is that it has to, ha it has to be economically sustainable for any project to work. It can't come from a nonprofit sort of background. How? How are the people running this project going to keep it running? Um, if it's a project for education, for instance, and you build a school, um, how are you going to train and support teachers in that school? There's so many school buildings here that are empty because the state or the community didn't have the funds to be able to keep a teacher employed. 
Um, so what are the ways in which building economy into these development projects and building like an, a real economic model, literally a business plan for these projects, how is that going to, to change the way in which development funds are coming into African being used for actual, actually something productive, as in contributing to the, the GDP of the country? Because when you have when you have all of this money being dropped in a country without much M and E to, to see what the impact of it is, it destabilizes economies. It it does so much it does so much negative. And I think there's a lot of room to be able to combine um, business and and use that for for good <laughs> social business. You know, use it use it to make this money sustainable, to make this this um, this impact sustainable, to make the projects um, work for the country, for the community, for the people. Um, so that's something that, that really was a big revelation for me, um, coming and seeing it on the ground and like, okay, this is what needs to happen. Because it was like, I knew that this, this happened, but what's the solution? What is a solution, a potential solution to it? Because development money isn't going to stop coming. And so how do we take it and make it profitable, make it, make it, um, Productive. Can I read your paper? Oh, you know what? Girl, I don't know if that paper exists anymore. I don't know where it is. <laughs> I've lost so many computers and hard drives since then. <laughs> oh, man. Actually, it's funny because I, I did two senior theses and then the other one I did was um, on my family because um, I come from a royal family. So um, the Massacoy family founded the Vi tribe, that people are Vi. And so I did a whole um, study on the Vi people and the beginning, I traced my family back to the 1400s and the migration down to where they're now in um, Liberia, Sierra Leone. And um, I had a cousin recently ask me for that paper and I was like, that's so sad. I spent so much time and effort on it. I don't know where it is. <laughs> is it exhausting? Yes. <laughs> Without a shadow of a doubt, it is exhausting. If you see bags under my eyes, it's because I stayed up all night last night. This is hard. It is hard. And I try to be very careful about way, the way in which I portray working here and building a business because there's a lot of people who are so excited about coming back and like, oh, and you come with like this, this energy that can quickly be stifled even suffocate it out if you don't understand the reality of what it is to live and work here and build a company. It's hard. It's hard. Um, it's a lot about who you know. Um, many, in Guinea especially, a lot of systems just don't function. And so, um, and so you just have to really, you have to learn like the, it's a game. Like working, I feel like working in, in West Africa in general is like there's a game because governmental systems, systems that should support you to build a business, for instance, don't, aren't very strong. If they exist, they're not strong. Um, in some countries, they're stronger than others. In Guinea, it's very, it's very weak. And so, and so I, I want to be, I want to be careful when I, when I portray, because I don't want people to take their whole life savings and say, oh my God, Wiata's doing it. So I'm going to just, you know, jump in there and, and, and do it myself. So I'm very careful about how I, how I portray it. It's hard. It's definitely hard. And I'm tired. <laughs> I want to sleep right now. <laughs> but um, but it's it's. I also believe that certain people are pioneers, right? There has to be somebody that comes first and lays the groundwork. And not everybody is ready to to do that because it's a painful journey. It's lonely often. It's painful. It's it's a lot of work. Um, and I I'm someone who has a very high tolerance for pain. <laughs> in general, so I'm, I'm able to put myself into very difficult situations or, you know, environments in order to achieve my goal. If I told you some of the places I've lived and things I've lived through in Guinea, it's, you'd, you'd be completely disgusted. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's incredible the things I've, I've been able to put myself through. Um, but not everybody is ready for that. And you have to, you have to be very aware of what, it, what the reality is. And I really consider myself as someone who's laying the ground. Like I want to be able to make it more friendly and easier for other people to come after, after me and to work with me and to partner with me. 
like the keto was able to come from the states without any experience in guinea and help me to start this business and i want that to be what people feel when they're coming that there's something already already going they have a system that they can come into um so that's yeah it, it is definitely hard you know i like i like what you said because we're also trying to tell a story about like a different africa and entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and it's very interesting that you said that you have to be careful about what you portray mm -hmm. and what you say to people is possible mm -hmm. so um what's your take on or like how do you see it being open to uh, like giving this kind of information to people within the ecosystem and mm -hmm. anyone who's out of the ecosystem or in diaspora and mm -hmm. wants to come back mm -hmm. and um, and make a change? Right. So for me, um, I think that Africa in general, there's so many opportunities. There's huge opportunities. And speaking in, about Guinea specifically. Guinea is a hard place to live, but that's because it's it's everything's growing, everything's new. It's not because it's impossible or you know whatever. It's the people or I, anything, any negative negative, um, like it's just Africans or it's just Guineans or all of these negative words that people use around Africa. Um, it's not that. It's it's a burgeoning country, and and I like to use the analogy of like the United States in the very beginning of, of its nascence. Like, um, the I, I have this documentary that I watch often. It's called The Founding Fathers, um, and it's basically about all of the founding fathers who were there um, in the very beginning. They they went into you know railways or you know um, t uh, Alexander Graham Bell or. Um, who went into gas production, for instance. Um, these people are now the, the richest families in the world, you know? And so I like to compare it to that because this is the wild, wild west in that sense. It's, there is so much to do. There's so much opportunity. And if you have the, the nature to be able to withstand the being in a very nascent, very young place that's growing, that systems don't work well, you know, things you have to figure it out and learn it, you can do it, you know? And there is so much to be done and money to be made. I mean, we can really be wealthy here. I watched something um, recently, uh, it was Akon who said that in Africa, you can build a Fortune 500 company in three years. And that's absolutely true, absolutely true. Like even with Aqua Farms Africa, for instance, we are gonna be within actually um, eight months of investment, we're already we're already out of the out of the red. I mean, that's incredible. Where else can you do that in the world? You know, where else can you build a company that has the? And we're going to be expanding already next year to other to neighboring countries. We're going to be exporting to to Senegal, Mali, Cote d'Ivoire. We're going to be building another hub in Ghana to serve Southern West Africa. I mean, where else in the world can you build a company that quickly with very with with little investment, I'll say in comparison to other to other companies, um, and to, and investment in other countries. I mean, the opportunities are absolutely endless, and so I think that we have to be realistic about the environment. You know, we can't we can't say that you know it's all roses and you know like the the environment is the environment, but it's also exciting. You know, it's also if you're an entrepreneur, this place is like this is where you need to be. You know, like. I'm always seeing business ideas. It's like, it's more about which ones do I not do? You know, what do I not pursue? What can I do within my, you know, financial reach? Like, what can I invest? What is, where do I put my time and effort? But there's opportunities everywhere. It's, it's all the time. It's such an exciting place to be. Like, I know I would have never been able to reach where I've, where I've come if I stayed in America, you know? And I've, I've done this, I guess, Dare to Innovate. I was a Peace Corps volunteer for two years, Dare to Innovate. Um, really, we've been formal, a formal company, um, a formal business since 2015. And so, what, that's four years? In four years, like, it's amazing what we've been able to accomplish, you know? I would have never, if I was in America, I'd be working a desk job, you know, at a development agency. I'd probably be doing, like, you know, project management. Um, I'd be hanging out with my friends on the weekends, probably have a local bar that I go to. I mean what would I be doing? And here I'm like with, with every business idea and it doesn't even, you know, with every business idea, I'm like impacting, I'm, I'm creating change. And um, 
It doesn't even have to be a super innovative idea. Because nothing's been done here, the simplest ideas make ridiculous returns. I'll give you an example. One of our value chains is baking, bakery, boulangerie. And so we have a, a franchise called Sogi Pen. And um, I mean, it's a $20,000, $25,000 investment for one franchise. Um, and it pays itself back in a year. Here, Guinea, they, I mean, there's a shortage of bread in the city. Like, people eat bread every day. There's a shortage. People usually are not getting the bread that they, that they, that they need. And it's like the simplest idea. Recently, I have another, actually, one of our investors in, in Aqua Farms Africa. He has a company that um, is a telecoms company. Um, he's done also, uh, he's in the energy space, but he, he found this opportunity at all of the hotels in Conakry. If, if you want to recharge your phone, like Orange or, you know, get like more, more credit, you have to go outside of the hotel um, to like a store and get it and then come back in the hotel. No one had thought, how about you create the system that will allow someone at a hotel to be able to just recharge at the desk? Simplest little ideas, huge returns. like. This simple, I, I give the example all the time that like if I was in the States and I wanted to start a restaurant, there's a billion, like you have to spend a ridiculous amount of money to have something that's really, I mean, or have a really interesting and innovative idea like vegan, I don't know, watermelon, whatever, like something really like, you know, interesting that draws people in. Like here, if you just start a restaurant that like works <laughs> nice. and nice and clean and has good service, you're golden. You're going to make money. The service industry here is booming. Like restaurants, I would go every day. Like, like you know, it's, it's, it's so, there's so many opportunities. The barrier to entry is in terms of financial investment is smaller, is lower. In terms of um, innovation, need to innovate is, is lower. I mean, you really can come in and do things that are already, are already have been done in America for decades and here it's it's an innovation just because of the context so we also try a lot of times when we're talking to people about what is innovation they're thinking like lots of are like the context is what is innovative about giving like aquaponics is nothing new there's aquaponics farms all over the state it's not being done here you know it's just it's just the context that makes things that makes things innovative here so i mean that's that's what i would say in general Actually, and this is where I think we're really innovative actually in our business model um, with the franchise system is that aquaponics even in the States is being done, but no one is scaling it and making it available to the local population in general, right? So the idea that with a 12 by 12 space, you can have an entire farm is, is for me huge. I think it's a disruption in the in the industry, not only here but even even in America. And we want to have we want to create south to north, or um, I don't know east to west, whatever, in a um, transfer of, of technologies and innovation. And I think this could be one. I imagine um, Aqua Farms Africa even being in food deserts in the states. Um, I imagine it being in southeast Atlanta. I did my studies in in um, at Emory University in Atlanta. So I can completely imagine Southeast Atlanta, you set up your aqua farm system. We manage, again, the two market side of the product. So we, we do pickups of produce, we do, we do quality control checks, and we then market to supermarkets um, and restaurants, high quality, locally produced um, food that's a bit, it's accessible to everyone can be a farmer. You know, anyone can be a farmer. So. I think that that's, and it's also the, the other side of the market, which is that everyone's into locally, locally made, you know, produced food, um, no, no, G, M, G, uh, yeah, organic food, uh, GMO, no G, GMO organic food. And so this makes it accessible and also um, brings your, brings your prices down as well. So I think it's something that we can, we can really expand everywhere. I see this being, I want us to list within five years. Um, Aqua Farms Africa. After here, we're definitely, like I said, we're going to use Guinea as a hub to export to local, to, to um, neighboring countries before we actually go into the market and set up, set up hubs. And we're also going to set up a hub in Ghana to serve like Nigeria, um, Togo, Benin. And um, I think once we hit the Nigerian market, <laughs>
that's going to be, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> You mentioned the 25 women that you've trained so far. Do you have any personal relationships with the, with the people that you're impacting, like in a mentorship uh, sort of situation? Or do you have any mentors yourself? I do, yes. So I have several mentors that are, they're people who have come back and started businesses and are successful in on the continent. So. I have several mentors that are dear, near, dear to me, who have helped guide me in like how I'm moving forward, what are decisions I, I'm making, what makes sense for me in my in my career and where I'm going, um, and in my vision. Um, they've also been my connectors to investors, to people who can believe in what we're doing and what I'm doing. Um, for the women, um, I don't personally mentor them just because I don't have the time. It's something that I. You know, as we grow, it's something that I don't have the you know the time to be able to do anymore. But the team does. They're they're very um, very hands on. I mean, this our team here are their mentors. So this is actually one of our one of our entrepreneurs that we that we train is going to be starting a, a a system soon. So um, so they're very closely coached by the team. Absolutely, they all of our entrepreneurs going through the incubator or starting a franchise have coaches they have mentors um they're they are supported from beginning to end even within our incubator at dare to innovate um normally with incubators you have a period of time that you're incubated and then you know you go with dare to innovate we say that you're you're in dare to innovate forever like as long as you have a business life of your business you're here because the reality is that even if you finish your incubation period we still live in this environment, and it's much easier for me to open doors than for you. Um, and that's that's sad, but it's the reality. So I'll give you an example. We had one of our entrepreneurs just recently who um, started a mobile veterinary clinic in the middle part of the country, Puta Jalo, in Pita. And um, he wanted to be in contact with the Minister of Elevage, um, which is animal husbandry, or animal raising. Um, and so he, of course, it was, hard for him to get that get that meeting or get that connect and but I'm easily able to walk into that office and build a partnership and then connect him to the ministry and so now he serves as one of the service providers for the ministry on vaccination campaigns he was able to benefit from um, a training of eleva or no veterinarians on um, on uh, uh, artificial insemination for instance so we continue even though he's been with dead in the sense of 2000 and let's see 13 we're able to continue to provide them services you know and help them so you're when you're part of dare innovate some network you're you're with dare innovate forever so and it's the same thing with Aqua. i mean it's a franchise system so with the franchise system you get support continuously because you're paying a franchise fee as well you know that's a part of the part of the system so you get you get that so you get that continued service you get that support we talked about uh, development and you mentioned that for it to be sustainable there has to be uh, like a business model and an economic aspect of it all my question would be what is development for you mm. in general because for example, we have been to all these places. We've been to um, uh, Kundara, Pita, Labe, Kandika, and all these places. And it's, I don't want to say shocking, but it's very interesting that there are still certain ways that are very traditional of living and very domestic, like just people like in a lasso, walking through like with a, a bucket of water on their head and so on and and they, they don't seem to be like missing anything you know they're just going about their lives having a uh, day-to-day going farming like this and like that so my question for you would be what exactly is development for you mm. that's such a hard question right such a hard question because i mean there's two things. One, development. When I talk about development, I'm talking more about the industry of development. So development as the monolith of aid, right? Development. So the development industry, when I'm talking about, you know, what needs to change within it. But if I talk about development as the, the concept of what is development, um, I mean, even if you see that um, 
for instance, a woman who is in a village and she has to go and get water every day for her family. Um, it's not always sure if that water is clean. Um, the, 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 um, what is the, the lifespan? Lifespan here is like 50s, um, 60s. Um, you, you have very high infant mortality rates. Um, the, if a woman was able to be able, even, even if you put a water pump, for instance, in a village, it already reduces the amount of time that she spends in her day just getting basic, basic needs. And she's able to then contribute that time to possibly um, um, money-making activity that brings more income to her family so that they can be better off in terms of education, in terms of, in terms of health, right? Um, healthcare is very, is very, I mean, very expensive. It's, it's, it's expensive um, because people are poor. It's actually not expensive if you compare it, of course, to like the states, which is exorbitant, you know, healthcare. So it's not that it's expensive, it's just that people are poor and can't afford it. Um, there's people who die here often just because for the simplest the simplest um, of diseases or medical health issues. So, an education. Education, for instance, you have a lot of um, people who can't afford to take their kids to school. Um, the state is not, is not also fronting all of the costs for public school um, and parents have to, have, to, have to support their kids with uniforms and books and such. You find a lot of times teachers which is the same situation in the states, which is funny to me. But teachers are paying for, for, um, for school supplies and, and things like that. Um, a student might get to a certain level of, uh, in school, and then their family can't afford for them to go to school anymore. All of these things, for me, is like the first level of development. We can talk about how well you know, or we can bring up the the controversial idea, like. You know, shouldn't we just leave everything, you know, like let people just be in there? But it's like there's so much that is a risk to their livelihood that I think development is there. That's that's the first level of development. How can we give people freedom, like economic freedom and access to to services that are basic needs um, like education, water, food? You know, those those are things that are important. Um, but I think that it has to be an economic um, it has to be economically backed. It can't just be, okay, here's food, you know, here's education. Like, it needs to be a growing of the entire economy to be able to support that. Um, so that's what, that's when I think about development. On another level, I think about development in terms of freedom, you know, which I just stated, but economic freedom to me is the, is the very basis of, of development. I can't get education for my kids if I don't have the, 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 the funds to do it. I can't get access to clean water if I don't have the funds to do it. I can't have access to good foods in order that my kids have a diverse, you know, uh, nutrient, you know, diverse in nutrient intake if I don't have the money to do it. The state itself can't provide those services if it doesn't have the money to do that or if the money is not being dispersed in a, in a way that's equi equitable. Is that the word? <laughs> so, all of those, all of that, is at the base of it, to me, is economic freedom. What would be your advice to the people that don't have all this money to invest uh, or come back? That are just being born here, and that are young, maybe open-minded. What would be your advice to them? It's very hard to be honest because the. I would love to say, come to Dare to Innovate, we'll help you all, but it's it's just not a reality. Like we can we can only support a certain number of of youth every year, right? And there's so much need. If you think about an unemployment rate of youth of 71%, you know, the the need is astronomical. Um, I mean, if I if I were if I were a young person, I mean, what, what advice I would give is that education is important, is one. So being able to, to be as educated as you can to get employment is, is one thing. It's also, re, it's also giving yourself the resources in order to be able to advance in life. So education is important. Um, this is that 
um, you have to find ways to um, to create create employment for yourself and not wait on everyone else. I know it's difficult. <laughs> it's extremely difficult, but you have to find ways to do that. Um, I would say find, if you can, any sort of entrepreneurship or, or management course. I would say get involved with cooperatives that are in your community because you can learn a lot from um, seeing how they how they work and how they're how they're making money even though they're making money on a on a low on a low level but you're able to see how a business works i would say go and, and spend time in businesses do all you can to to amass as many resources and competencies as you can in your immediate environment and opportunities open you know that those sort of if you're able to to build your mind yourself through the resources that are existent to you um opportunities will become available um you'll start to see opportunity doors start to open for you if you have if you start to give yourself that opportunity to expand your current resources your current state of mind where you're at so do as much as you can to just feed yourself is what i would say Human resources is the biggest issue I deal with, absolutely. And I think it's an issue across across West Africa, and I'll say that because of the education systems. In other countries, of course, it's better than others. Like, we found a lot of great, great candidates from Senegal or from um, Abidjan, uh, even Nigeria, Ghana. Um, in Guinea, specifically, human resources is a huge issue because of the, the, the poor... Um, just just the, the education system isn't developed. And so you have, it's very hard to find good people who understand certain things and because they're not necessarily exposed. And so something I say all the time is that when you are committing to work here, to build a business here, you're committing to developing a country. You're committing to developing people because that doesn't exist in the country yet. So even if your bottom line is profit, you have to commit to developing people in order for your business to work because it doesn't exist. So you have to be committed to that. It is the number one issue that I have, absolutely. To invest uh, with, with any of the social franchises that Dare to Innovate um, has developed. So Aqua Farms Africa, we also have social franchises and like I said, um, dried fruit, um, and in other agricultural businesses. Um, we also in uh, boulangerie, um, in uh, brick making, for instance, we have, we have different businesses. Um, in order to invest, uh, you can contact me, actually directly, wiata, W-I-A-T-T-A, -T -T at daretoinnovate.com. Um, we're also right now in the process of developing a platform um, that will allow um, anyone who's interested to invest in um, in any of these social franchises. So stay tuned for that. Our website is www.daretoinnovate.com. Aquafarms Africa is www.aquafarmsafrica.com. Um, if you want to keep up with uh, the evolution of the, the franchise in aquaponics. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>